We are intuitive people. We have a tendency to make decisions based upon what seems correct. In most people's mind, there's nothing wrong with this way of thinking. Heck, all we're doing is making a decision the best way we know how. Unfortunately, the best way we know how sometimes is not correct. Thus, perception is not necessarily always reality. What do you think about my garage? Nice bike, huh? Our learning objectives today include first, to investigate how people make decisions. Secondly, to identify the steps of the scientific method. Third, to establish the process involved in the publication of peer-reviewed literature. Fourth, to identify valid sources of information. Fifth, to identify how peer-reviewed publications are used by professionals in the medical field. And finally, and most importantly, to determine how to make informed decisions regarding personal health. Tell me, which line is longer? Most people perceive the line on top to be longer. However, if we measure the two lines, you'll find that both are the exact same length. How about these? Do they look straight or curved? They almost assuredly looked curved to you. However, they are not. Feel free to pause the video and hold a straight edge up to the screen. You will quickly notice that these lines are indeed straight. You might be thinking, these examples are simply optical illusions and have little to nothing to do with healthcare. But I will argue otherwise. I will argue that most people make decisions regarding their health care based upon skewed information. All of us are exposed to marketing campaigns. And we have to ask, how valid is that information? Well, we're going to change gears for just a second. Luckily, most, and I will say that uh, with trepidation, most of us are exposed to professional health care. Luckily, that's getting better. But most of us are exposed to professional health care in the forms of doctors and nurses. And these people are competent and they, in most cases, and they do have the ability to convey to you valid health care information, and in, in particular, valid lifestyle information. But you need to ask yourself, how much time am I really spending with these people? Now, I want you to ask yourself a question. And I really do want you to ask yourself this question and take a moment and pause and answer it. On average, how much time does my primary care physician spend with me per appointment? I have a feeling your answer is less than 15 minutes. It's just the nature of health care. So, premise number one. We're not getting an adequate amount of information. We're just not exposed to it often enough. Now, secondarily, I want you to ask another question. How often am I exposed to marketing information on food, drugs, exercise equipment, and supplements? And in particular on that last one, I'm talking about dietary supplements. If you're the, av if you're the average American, the answer is daily. Heck, they come to us on TV, uh, radio, the internet. They even come to us on our phones. And the reality is that that information is probably not as valid as you might like. So, premise number one, we lack an adequate volume of information. Secondarily, that information is oftentimes skewed. Let's look at an example. I want you to tell me, what has more vitamin C? A cup, and I do mean a measuring cup, of broccoli, or one whole orange? Have a feeling you're saying an orange. Here we have the nutrition information for one orange and a cup of broccoli. <laughs> How about that? One orange has 70 milligrams of vitamin C. One cup of broccoli has 78. Hmm. I now want you to watch a video. Please navigate to YouTube and search for Nivea Good Space by Saylight. Nice spelling of goodbye there, but that is what I want you to do. 
And right here is the video I would like for you to watch. Nivea, goodbye cellulite. And in keeping with copyright law, I can only show you a very small excerpt here, but I do want you to watch the entire video. The challenge? Launch Nivea's Goodbye Cellulite. The landscape, a cluttered environment, bombarded with products fat with false and failed promises. U.S. consumers at large were tired of deceit in an emotional space that needed some genuine results. Genuine results. At this time, go ahead, pause this video, and go and watch that video. I probably don't have to tell you this, but I'm not sure that everything you just heard and saw is really true. How about you? Did you buy it? No. I didn't think so. As I said before, our perception of reality can be skewed when information is presented to us in a misleading way. By the way, subsequent to the video that you just saw being released, the Federal Trade Commission find the <laughs> out of Nivea. Sorry, little ears. Hopefully you can agree with my two assertions. First, that people are not getting an adequate amount of information from valid sources. Limited information means limited perspective on what is correct. Secondly, much of the health related information that people get from common sources such as television, radio, and the internet is skewed. If you don't believe me, I recommend that you pause this video and view an article by CBS News that brings to light just how frequent consumers are misled by some of the biggest companies in America. As a student at James Madison University, one of the most, one of the most profound things I learned was that I wasn't there to learn things. Seems a bit odd. A professor by the name of David Winnis once said on the first day of class, school doesn't teach you what to think, it teaches you how to think. Another way of stating the same thing is education teaches you how to evaluate the quality of information to which you are being exposed. There's a tremendous amount of value in holding information to a high standard of proof, and the scientific method does just this. Go Dukes! As we begin talking about the scientific method, I want to share my opinion regarding what I think are the three greatest products of this method. Number one, the first law of thermodynamics, which states the energy of an isolated system is constant. Number two, E equals mc squared, Einstein's energy mass equivalence. And number three, everything on the internet is completely and totally true. <laughs> of course, we all know my last statement not to be true, but it's crazy the things people choose to believe simply because it's convenient. I want you to view the scientific method as a way of thinking or a philosophy, not just a way of doing an, an experiment. Many people do think of it just as a way to go about performing an experiment. However, the scientific method is much, much more than that. It is a method by which a body of knowledge can be built. This is true on a personal, institutional, and even a societal level. Valuing the importance of reproducible observations can provide personal enlightenment. Valuing reproducible data on an institutional level allows organizations such as the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Society, or Diabetes Association to refine their knowledge of how to prevent chronic disease. Galileo Galilei lived in Italy in the 16th century and is often affectionately referred to as the father of science. He is best known for his development of a telescope and his many subsequent observations. Interestingly, he is called the father of science, and he's best known for simply making observations. Does this really seem right? He was known for observing, and the simple fact of observing was significant enough for him to become referred to as the father of science? Interestingly, yes. The fact that he emphasized the importance of observations is exactly the reason why he's so well respected. He made observations so that others could come behind him and build upon his work. This is the basis of the scientific method. 
and higher level thinking. If something can be observed by multiple people, then there is greater validity to the information. The more people that make a scientific observation, the more widely accepted the observation becomes. Galileo was one of the first people to suggest that the Earth orbited the Sun, and that the Sun did not orbit around the Earth, as was the prevailing philosophy of the day. Because of his views, he was convicted of crimes against the Roman Catholic Church, and sentenced to house arrest, where he spent the last eight years of his life. It's easy to find the absurdity in this when you have the background knowledge that you and I have regarding the structure of the solar system. But keep in mind, we have that information because of observable data. It's largely because of Galileo that we now have a scientific community which values new information. Let's dig deeper into this idea of using the scientific method as a philosophy to build a body of knowledge regardless of the subject matter. Here we have an old world map, although it does represent our world as being round, and does give us a general idea of the location of the continents, it's not very accurate. Over the past 400 years, maps of the world have progressively become more accurate through a very basic process, observe and report. People have simply been observing geography and then reporting. As technology has improved over time, an enormous amount of geographic data has been compiled, thus giving us extremely accurate maps. The first step in the scientific method is simply to have a question, and people have been doing this for a long time. Secondly, to make a hypothesis based upon your current knowledge. By the way, if you're ever doing your own personal research, it's always a good idea to do plenty of research before putting your hypothesis into writing. Third, create an experiment that allows for the collection of data. Fourth, to record the results. This is the observation piece. And finally, fifth, put your results into writing. Here you have the rover Curiosity, which can currently be found on the surface of Mars. A tremendous amount of science went into building it. Although I don't know the scientists that designed it personally, I guarantee the scientific method was used when making decisions regarding its design. You're not going to find many intuitive decisions being made by this group of people. Pretty cool, huh? In this slide, you'll notice the tire tread is not uniform. Why might this be? Let's think about it for a moment. Surely, a handful of scientists were given the responsibility to design the ideal tire tread. Step number one, a question. What is the best tire tread to put on this multi-million dollar vehicle? Well, the first thing they probably did was some research, and they looked at the current published literature. Let's face it though, there isn't much scientific literature on what tire tread is most effective on Mars. Keep in mind, Curiosity is significantly larger than its predecessors, so information can only be extrapolated from previous missions. Nonetheless, scientists had to create a tire tread. So they had to start out by making their best guess regarding tread design. Step number two, they formed a hypothesis based upon what they already knew, and they made a guess at what tire tread would work best. Step number three, it's time to create an experiment. Of course, they couldn't go to Mars to do an experiment, so they found terrain similar to that on Mars and tested numerous designs. So they recorded data on the performance of different tread types. And finally, step number three, they put their findings on paper. Well, maybe not actual paper, but you know what I mean. Now here's where it gets interesting. You will notice in the picture that there are two distinctly different patterns on each wheel. Over time, scientists will collect data on how well the two separate tire treads work on the surface of Mars, and that observational data will assuredly play an enormous role in the design of future tire treads. As the data grows, the scientific literature on this obscure topic will also grow. The more observational data that is present, the better decisions people will be able to make in the future. This tiny piece of science is in its infancy, but over time, more information will be collected, and the body of knowledge on this topic will improve. The same phenomenon occurs in every field of science. My previous example may seem unrelated to health, but interestingly, the exact same process of question, hypothesis, experiment, and report is used in evaluating risk 
for chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. Because of the observational data that has been collected, we now know the risk factors for each major chronic disease. For example, the medical field has a tremendous amount of data that shows a high fat and high cholesterol diet contributes significantly to the risk for cardiovascular disease, that cigarette smoking causes cancer, and more recent findings are showing a direct relationship between the amount of sugar a person eats and his or her risk for diabetes type 2. My last and most important point about the scientific method is that it is reproducible. If a person wishes to replicate a study to confirm its results, he or she can do so. If data cannot be reproduced, then the original findings are of little value and they fade into oblivion. Observational data is of little use to society unless it is easily accessible by large numbers of people. Peer-reviewed journals provide professionals an avenue to convey their findings to the world. The process starts when a professional, in many cases a college professor, doctor, or scientist, has a question. Subsequently, he or she performs an experiment, collects data, and writes a manuscript, chronicling every step of the research and findings. The manuscript is then submitted to a journal that is specific to the type of research being done and a group of professionals that have expertise related to the topic of the research will read it and collectively make a decision regarding whether or not to publish it. If the manuscript is published, it joins the scientific body of knowledge to forever contribute to science marching forward. If the review board chooses not to publish the manuscript, they send it back to the author with recommendations. Not all information is equally valid. so. Where do we get the good stuff? What you see in front of you is a list of just a few of the many medical journals that publish peer-reviewed literature. Keep in mind as you look at this scrolling list that these are just a few of the thousands of journals in the medical field. It's important to be able to determine which literature is peer-reviewed and which is not. Luckily, we have databases that make finding peer-reviewed literature easy to find. These databases are nothing more than really big lists, lists of peer-reviewed publications. Databases can easily be found at academic libraries, which oftentimes can be accessed online. Here you see a list of health and medical databases that can be found at New River Community College. Let's now take a look at how peer-reviewed publications are used by professionals. At the bottom of this stack of textbooks, you'll see Understanding Normal and Clinical Nutrition. This is the textbook I use in my nutrition course. It is a rather expensive text, but it is considered to be one of the best texts on the market for nutrition. As you can well imagine, my students have a distinct expectation that the information held within this book be valid. Let's now take a look at an excerpt from this book. Here on page 255, Sharon Rolfs writes, healthcare professionals commonly use BMI and waist circumference measures because they are relatively easy and inexpensive. Together, these two measures prove most valuable in assessing a person's health risks and monitoring changes over time. You'll now see the number 18 there at the end of the sentence, and these numbers are very common in textbooks. These are references to the original work. And if we go to the reference section for this chapter, we will see what that original work is. And we'll see that number 18 is the position of the American Dietetic Association on Weight Management. That was published in the Journal of the American Dietetics Association, Volume 109, in the year 2009, and you can find that on pages 330 through 346. Decisions regarding health and wellness are often made based upon personal intuition. This is often the result of lack of information due to the fact that people spend limited amounts of time with qualified medical personnel and have limited access to valid health information. Secondly, people are exposed to biased information that skews their perception of reality.
Next, the most important aspect of the scientific method is that it is based upon observation, not intuition. The steps in the scientific method include, first, having a question, then making an educated guess regarding an answer or what is also called the hypothesis. Next, design and perform an experiment to test the hypothesis. Then the most important aspect of the process, observe the experiment and collect data. Finally, create a report based upon the findings. Another important aspect of the scientific method is that experiments are reproducible, meaning that other people can perform the exact same experiment in the future. This allows for the validation of data. The world deserves access to research findings. Although not accessed by the general public as much as they should be, there are a tremendous amount of peer-reviewed journals where scholarly articles are published. The publication process includes the following steps. Due diligence always comes first in the form of research. The research is described in a manuscript with an emphasis on the data and analysis of that data. The manuscript is then submitted to a professional journal. A group of experts then reviews the manuscript. If the experts deem that the research was performed in an acceptable manner without bias and deem the findings to be of interest to the scientific community, the manuscript is published. Finally, if the manuscript is not published, it is sent back to the author with recommendations for future research. Peer-reviewed professional articles are easy to access by utilizing databases. And lastly, it's important to understand that part of being a professional is utilizing valid information to guide your work. This is especially true in the medical field. When consuming health information, regardless of whether it's from television, radio, the internet, or from your family physician, you deserve to know which information is valid and which is not. I personally hope that you find value in the scientific method, not just as a way to do an experiment, but in how it allows society to build a scientific body of knowledge that you and everyone else can use to promote health and well-being. Now, let's ride.